let's get started right here at the table saw. Now, a lot of woodworkers consider the table saw to be the center of their workshop. And, you know, physically for me, uh, the center of my workshop is right about here where this uh, ductwork comes down that uh, is for the dust collection on this. So as much as I uh, <laughs> hate to say it, the table saw really is the center of my workshop. Um, here I'm using the Hammer K3 for uh, this demo, but honestly this demo will, will really not uh, be limited to sliding table saws. It's going to be uh, pretty all-encompassing. So whether you have a tabletop model, a job site saw, or an industrial style saw, um, it's going to be good for that. And again, uh, the table saw, once again, is the center of my shop. I'm using my K3, uh, but directly to the right of this, off camera, I also have a Powermatic 66 that I've had for well, forever. Um, and what I'm going to show you, like I said, is going to work for all of these saws. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what a table saw is, how it came to be, uh, things you should look for if you were going to try and buy a new or a used saw, um, things that I consider really important um, qualities no matter what level of saw you're looking to own. Uh, and hopefully at the end of uh, this, whole, this whole session, you're going to walk away with um, a pretty good understanding of how to operate the saw safely. And, you know, that's really what this is all about because like I said, a lot of people think that the table saw is the center or the core of their power tool woodworking shop, and it certainly can be. It is a super versatile tool. There's so many things that you can do on it uh, beyond just ripping and cross-cutting boards. Uh, you can make moldings. You can do dados, grooves, rabbits, something we'll cover next week. Uh, with a few jigs and appliances, something that we'll uh, start to work on here for the at the final week of the shows this month, um, you'll see that you'll be able to do all kinds of uh, additional things with your saw other than just straight line cuts, and that really is pretty important stuff. So let's go over real quickly what a table saw is and how it came to be. Um, you know, the circular saw isn't a new invention. Um, the circular saw blade, uh, in particular, uh, has, has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's not a, a new thing. Um, typically, however, it, it was ma it's mounted on an arbor and it spins, right? Um, typically, however, it was attached to an arbor that was powered uh, initially either by um, animal power or uh, water power or something like that to make it spin and it was used for processing logs uh, into turning it into lumber and it wasn't until the mid 19th century 1860s or so that a, a shaker sister added uh, the table to it and brought it into the shop and when we start to think about why add a table to it and what does that do um, it gives us a little better understanding of the purpose of the tool so think about it this way um, prior to that 1860s you know for almost 200 years we had those circular saws uh, functioning in, in, uh, in some capacity throughout the world. Um, the vast majority of uh, lumber was still being processed early on um, via up and down saws or band saws as we get closer to that 1860 date. Um, so this thing's spinning and what they would do is they would have a carriage 
that move the log back and forth beyond the, uh, uh, you know, through the saw, creating boards. Um, so without a table, uh, think about it this way, and I am not suggesting that anyone ever tries this. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate it. I can't even turn the saw on with this guard open. Um, the machine is completely inactive. Uh, but if I turned it on and this blade was spinning, think about it in terms of what would happen if I were to just insert the board this way in an attempt to rip it along its length. Um, as I came in contact with the, the blade, uh, all of that force, all of that energy would grab that board and kick it out. In other words, create a kickback. Um, which, when you really think about it, uh, kickbacks are, you know, they constitute about two-thirds of all injuries that occur on table saws. Um, a, a third or slightly less comes from actual contact with that spinning blade. Uh, it's more, much more likely that as you're putting boards in there, it's going to bind in some fashion and kick out with some extra force and an awful lot of velocity. And um, I'll give you a story here in a little while that'll explain why you don't want that to happen. Um, so by adding a table to the table saw, what we've done, uh, or what that shaker sister did anyway, was uh, she di redirected the force or the energy of that spinning blade down and at the table. And what that did was it, it now gives us a, a much greater measure of control over that cut, okay? Because in the end, as we, as we as woodworkers process that material, that raw material, that uh, lumber from rough sawn uh, through to a finished piece of furniture uh, or whatever, or architectural millwork or whatever you're building, the objective is to have our tools create smoother, straighter, more accurate cuts in order for us to be able to work to a much finer degree um, than just literally nailing two limbs of a tree together. So um, by adding the control of a tabletop to the spinning blade, it allows us to refine or uh, increase the accuracy, the straightness, and the smoothness of that cut. That is also enhanced by the fact that we can add um, a couple more really simple appliances to our table saw. The first being kind of a squeaky uh, um, rip fence to it. And what I want, what I want you to do, if we're going to talk about the things that you should look for, whether you're buying a brand new saw or a used saw, or you just want to see if the saw you have is any good, um, I want you to find whatever class saw you're looking to buy, I want you to find one that has the most rigid rip fence assembly you can get. And if you can't, if it doesn't come with one, um, see if you can get an aftermarket uh, assembly that is uh, much more rigid. This is an old, uh, again, this is a relatively new saw, the Hammer K3, um, but they went with an, an older style. Uh, the, the Delta Unisaws used to come through with this kind of uh, a rip fence assembly. It's got a big cast iron locking mechanism uh, that allows me to slightly adjust the parallelism of the, bl of the uh, rip fence to the blade. Um, it also allows me to remove the fence, rotate it down, and I can use it in, up or, in the up or down position depending on the type of material that I'm cutting. I tend to use it more often in the down position than the up position. Uh, unless I'm uh, using some of my uh, jigs and fixtures that require it to be in the up position, but you'll hear more about those in a few weeks at the end of the month in the last show. Um, so when I lock the fence down, what I'm talking about for you to look at 
is lock it into position and I want you to go out on that end that I want you to wiggle it and it ought to be pretty stiff. Um, if it is not, at that point, if your heart is set on that table saw, then try and find an aftermarket fence that you can buy and bolt on um, that will give you that rigidity. If the goal of having a table saw is to create smoother, straighter, more accurate cuts, a, a, ri a rip fence that flexes as you push material against it doesn't give you any of those. In fact, it could cause some dangerous situations depending on how much, um, how much that, that fence actually moves as you push against it. So as rigid a system as you can get, um, the, the rigidity keeps us nice and parallel to the blade. So that means I get a nice, smooth, straight, accurate cut. Additional accuracy or additional uh, flexibility with our saw is added when we throw in a miter gauge. Uh, now, on my uh, sliding table saw, this thing is uh, set up and is super accurate. I bring it back against the, uh, the stop here and I know that I'm perfectly square to my blade and it allows me to cut straight away. Uh, even on my Powermatic 66, I rarely use the stock miter gauge that comes with it. Uh, it tends not to be super accurate. It's got a narrow fence, which really doesn't give the material much support if you're cutting longer pieces uh, for cross cutting. So uh, for that, once again, come back at the end of the month and we are going to make uh, in this session uh, a uh, cross cut sled. So you'll be able to see why a crosscut sled is so much better than just your ordinary uh, miter gauge. Um, and you can even make those for tabletop, uh, benchtop, or, uh, or, or job site saws. Uh, nothing wrong with having a sled for either one of those. So we've got a basic uh, idea of how the thing works. Let's take a look at um, what you ought to, the things that you ought to really look at in the order that I would look at them for purchasing a new saw or new to you saw. Um, the first thing I would do, because that table is so important to controlling the energy from that spinning blade, I want to make sure that if I'm going to, if I want to get straight, smooth, accurate cuts and hopefully you'll notice that there's a theme developing here. Um, I want that table to be as flat as possible. So again if you're working with a bench top or a job site saw or a cabinet saw or an industrial model and it doesn't matter if you go up to Felder's Kappa 4 seri series or if you're working with a, a little uh, Ryobi bench top model I want that table to be as flat as possible. If you're uh, going out to buy a saw, take an, along a known straight edge. I've got a three foot woodpecker's straight edge here. And um, the first thing I want to do is lower the blade all the way down. Now, a sliding table saw is slightly different. Um, normally I would just measure, I would, I'm not measuring anything, I would check by taking that known straight edge and laying it across the table corner to corner and then across the width and across the length and what I would be doing is I would be sighting underneath to see if there's any daylight. If I don't get any daylight in any of those four directions I know I have a flat surface. The reason I said that a sliding table saw is slightly different, at least I know that mine and all of the hammer and felder saws are, um, the slider is a couple of thousandths of an inch higher than the fixed table. The reason for that is, as we either rip or cross cut from that slider, we don't have that drag of the material on that stationary table, giving that little bit of twist or uh, resistance to the, the, the material as I cut it off, therefore I get a smoother, straighter, more accurate cut. 
So on this table, if I was going to look at a slider, I would check it diagonally on the stationary part. It's good. No daylight. No daylight. I have to go to a smaller ruler. And no daylight all the way up. I could then do the same thing on my slider to make sure that it's perfectly flat. Once again, if you check corner to corner, across the length and across the width of, it, uh, of any surface with a known straight edge, um, and you don't see daylight in any direction, you, ha you have a flat surface. That works not only for table saws, but it also works for um, processing lumber and your workbench, anything at all, uh, if you, you can check it that way. The second thing that I would check if I'm looking at purchasing a new saw is I would try and get to look inside and see um, how the trunnion system is set up and what it's made like. Uh, on a benchtop saw, you're liable to have a lot more sheet metal um, and plastic. If you can find a model that has more sheet metal, less plastic, or preferably no plastic, that trunnion system, uh, before I get too far into that, is what holds the arbor and allows it to raise and lower and tilt. Okay, it's that whole mechanism that's attached to the table. And um, as far as I know, most table saws today, the arbor is what tilts. Uh, I know Inca used to make a, a small job site saw where the table tilted. Uh, I'm not sure anybody does that anymore. It was a real um, wild thing to use, I can tell you. Um, but that whole mechanism that holds the arbor, the motor, all of that stuff up, and attaches it to the table is what you want to look at. And regardless of the, the level of saw that you're buying, try and buy the one with the best trunnion system, the most rigid trunnion system in the class of saw you're buying. And I don't care, once again, whether you're working on a bench top model, a job site saw, a hybrid saw, or a cabinet saw. Look at different models, look inside if you can. Um, Again, if you're working with a benchtop model and you can find one that's all uh, extruded aluminum parts underneath of there as opposed to plastic and sheet metal, um, go for the extruded one because the more rigid that trunnion system is that holds the saw in place, the less vibration and movement you're going to get out of the, the saw plate itself, which means smoother, straighter, more accurate cut. Um, I don't care as much about the ability to tilt and things like that. Um, you know, all of those things will work to a lesser or greater degree. Um, and I'm not working off the scales on any of the machines anyway. I tend to um, try and set things directly from the blade because there are some variations. Um, if I'm going to... buy a, a new saw or a, a new to me saw. Uh, the next thing that I wanna check after I've got a nice flat table and a good solid trunnion system under there, again, I'm gonna check and make sure that my squeaky rip fence uh, is good and rigid. Uh, if I don't have one, that's an aftermarket thing. You can probably buy one that will be. Um, you wanna make sure that it is parallel to the, the blade. Um, but the, before you check that, you want to make sure that the blade is parallel to your miter gauge slots because that's how you're going to get the most accurate cross cuts. And if it's not parallel, you have to get underneath and adjust the trunnions and how they attach to the top to bring it back to parallel before you can parallel up your rip fence. So the way to check that is I pick a single tooth. I set an adjustable square. Here I've got a double square, um, but you can use a combination square, anything where you can slide that um, blade of the, of the square over. I've got, I'm just hooking the edge of the body of the square right onto the edge of my miter gauge slot. And then I'm gonna lock it 
and you can hear I am just barely making contact. I am going to take that same exact tooth and bring it to the back, put my thing right into the same position, and you can hear it's hitting exactly the same on the back. So I know that my blade is parallel to my miter gauge slot. Now to check my squeaky, my squeaky rip fence, what I'm going to do is set my square up and do the exact same thing. I'm going to pick a tooth, bring my fence over until I get just barely touching, Oop, a little less, no, a little more, a little more. It's real woodworking, folks. There we go. All right, I'm just barely touching. I've got it locked down. I'm going to take that same tooth all the way to the back and check it there. And I get the same thing. So I know my fence is now parallel. If it isn't, there's a mechanism underneath there that I can adjust it to make it parallel. Uh, there is a, a theory in woodworking. If you read the magazines, the woodworking forums, some people tell you to set your uh, rip fence so that it is a few thousandths wider at the back than it is at the front because that reduces the possibility of your material catching on the back of the blade. If it catches on the back of the blade, it's going to lift and kick out. Uh, I don't subscribe to that because if my fence has any kind of deflection to it at all as I push my material through, if I've already got it set two thousandths and I, I can push my fence out a sixteenth of an inch, that's just even more. And what happens is as you start to push that material at an angle across away from the blade, you're, you're putting stress on there which could bind and kick that material out. So I try and keep it perfectly parallel um, because I'm not overly worried about it. Now you, the other thing you'll see is I've got a the riving knife in here. This is a full curve blade, full curve riving knife. You cannot buy a table saw in the United States today that does not contain a riving knife. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all riving knives are uh, made equally. Um, most riving knives uh, just simply sort of hang out behind the blade somewhere. For me, the whole idea of having a riving knife is to stop that material from drifting away from the fence as you're pushing it through and catching the back side of that blade and come out. So what I have my riving knife set up for is to not reduce the squeak on my, um, if I drop this down just a little bit, as I push the material through, which I'm going to try and loosen up my grip here, I'm trying, <clears throat> oh boy, needs a nice little jointing there. Um, what you'll find is I am just barely touching the saw blade at this point, but if I loosen that up, you can actually see my riving knife move a little bit. My riving knife is set up with this inside surface is in plane with the inside surface of the teeth of this blade. That way it's actually putting a little extra push on that outfeed side so that my material remains tight up against the fence as I push it through. Um, it, it's, it still functions as a splitter. In other words, if I'm, use, if I'm cutting material that has a lot of tension in it, it could pinch on here instead of binding on the back of the blade and kick out. So to me, that's something that's, if you, if you can remove the, the riving knife, which if you can put a stack dado on your saw, you have to be able to remove um, the riving knife. You'll see that next week. Um, but if you can remove it, you can adjust it by shimming it or doing whatever you have to do to make sure that this inside surface is in plane with uh, that uh, rips fence side of your, uh, your saw curve. 
So let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, when we're ripping, uh, since I've started on the, uh, the riving knife already, it's a natural progression here. Uh, the riving knife is really more for ripping than it is for any other operation. Like I said, as I move the material through, I want it to sort of keep that material pinned nice and snugly up against the rip fence, uh, and that way I can push it through. So for me, the, the narrowest material that I'm going to run without using a push stick, and I've got several... I've got several that I use uh, in the shop. Um, we've got the, uh, the gripper with the outrigger. I've got a gripper block, which I really like these because they've got those little uh, hooks that swing down and catch the back of your material. Uh, and we've also got shop made uh, push sticks in here as well. Um, so the narrowest material that I'm going to cut without using a push block for me is about three inches. That's not to say that that's the minimum you should use. Uh, the minimum you should use is what you are comfortable with. Uh, I'm not going to suggest you should go smaller than three inches, but if you're, if you're comfortable, if you're only comfortable down to about six or 10 inches, then that's what you should do. Um, because really, the safest part of using a table saw comes from you being comfortably uncomfortable using it, if you understand what I mean. What, I, what I'm saying is I don't want you to be scared and petrified of the machine, but I also don't want you to do something that makes you feel terribly uncomfortable when you do it because at that point you aren't focusing on the things that you need to focus on. When you're ripping, what you need to be doing is you need to be watching the contact between your material and the fence and make sure you're not starting to drift. You're not going to watch where it's cutting because nothing is happening there um, that is going to affect anything over here. This, however, if I start to drift away from the fence in one direction or the other, um, that's going to cause binding and potentially cause a kickback. When you get a kickback, you are not in control. So when you're not in control, bad things happen. Either this goes through you or someone else, or this goes into the blade. Um, years ago, uh, I had an assistant working in the shop. Uh, we'll call him Joe because, well, that was his name. Uh, and the shop was divided into two rooms. I had a bench room and a machine room. And we were working on some Bombay chess. And we were making these really thin uh, pieces. Actually, the class and I were in the bench room um, working on some hand tool stuff and prepping out stuff for the next couple of steps while Joe was in the machine room with the doors closed into the bench room and he was cutting one eighth inch thick by two inch wide pieces of uh, material for a base molding. So he raised the blade up, he had a piece of two inch thick stock, he brought his fence over, set it at one eighth of an inch which is what he wanted to do because we wanted to have one eighth inch uh, material that was accurate over its length. If I set the fence, I want to relative to the the blade, it's parallel. So the part that I want to keep always goes between the fence and the blade because then I know I'm coming off with a parallel strip or as parallel as I can get off of my machine. If I start to to take a wide board and cut and leave the waist out here at an eighth of an inch, not only do I have difficulty uh, setting that so that I get an accurate cut every single time, but as I cut, my piece here might not remain parallel, which means the eighth inch waist strip doesn't end up one eighth at either end. So the best way to do it is to bring your, your fence in so that you're set up 
so that you're parallel to the blade and you run the part you want to keep between the blade and the fence. Now, once again, he's cutting eighth inch by two inch wide, two inch tall material. So he was cutting and he had some kind of a push stick on there and he must have drifted away from the fence, uh, either going in or coming out the other side. And what I heard from inside the, uh, the bench room where the, the, the doors were closed and I had two I had a double steel door in between the bench room and the machine room, and you're about to find out why. Um, what I heard with the doors closed was the saw slow down. Yeah. And then I heard boom, bang. And what it was is that piece had drifted away somewhere, started to bind against the blade. He didn't have a riving knife in. It kicked out, and at that time, the, I had a 40-foot wide shop. The saw was right in the middle. So it traveled 20 feet, and I had built two great big um, wooden doors on the front of the shop. It buried its that little eighth-inch by two-inch piece that was about three feet long, buried itself in my front door over a quarter of an inch. It then bounced off of there, traveled the entire 40 feet back past the table saw, and the bang that I heard inside the bench room was when that piece struck the double metal door. Now, I'm not telling you this simply to scare you. I'm telling you this to, so that you start to understand that I don't care what size table saw you have, you are not going to overcome the power, it might only be a one or two horsepower motor on your saw. This has got a four horsepower motor on there. You're not going to overcome it, okay? And you're not going to do it fast enough to keep these out of the path of that material, uh, out of the path of the blade. And you're certainly not going to be able to leap out of the way fast enough that if it ejects this board from there at a high rate of speed, you're not going to get hit. Had Joe been standing, Behind the blade, behind the material, as he was cutting, that one eighth inch thick, two inch wide, three foot long piece would have gone directly through him. Think about the energy it took to throw it 20 feet, bury it into a door, a quarter of an inch, and then bounce it back 40 feet and hit a steel door with f uh, strong enough force that it startled people in the class. Okay, it would have absolutely, positively, um, impaled him. So first safety rule, keep your hands and your body out of the path of the blade and out of the path of the wood. So at no time when I am cutting anything do I get directly behind the material and at no time when I'm cutting is my my hand pushing so that if it if that material has tension on it and it breaks loose and I cut through it rather rapidly, I'm not ending up in the blade, okay? So obviously, you know, if you guys have uh, watched Norm Abram, you know that the first safety rule is to wear these safety glasses. Uh, I have mine attached to my, they're integral with my uh, headphones. So I've got hearing and eye protection on second most important rule keep your body and your body parts out of the path of the blade and out of the path of the material think before you start the saw and you know about all right if everything goes sideways and this thing completely crashes and burns while i'm cutting it how is that material going to be ejected and where is it going to drag my body parts so with that in mind I'm keeping off center. For me, that's to the left of the blade. I am pushing with my right hand towards the fence. This is my natural inc inclination when I push right-handed is to push towards the fence. My left hand is going to get planted right on the top of the saw and it's gonna guide that material as I start it out. I'm, you can see I've got my fingers set up so that I'm pushing tight to the fence and down to the table. 
At no time does my left hand move forward of this position. When I cut, I leave it right there. And when I exit the board, my hand comes off the table. I don't reach around to the back because if it binds and kicks back at that point, I'm going to drag my left hand back in. Um, another gore story for you real quick. Um, I worked in a shop for a long time that had a, a, quite a number of people working in there. Uh, one of the fellows had a stack dado set up on the, on the saw, which was, is essentially an entire group of saw blades stacked together so that you can make wider grooves and dados. He had to make a rabbit. <clears throat> so what he was doing was setting on a sacrificial fence. In other words, he was adding a board to the existing rip fence so that he didn't cut into it like someone did on the, the low edge of my, uh, my rip fence here. Uh, and what he did was he raised his stack dado up to the depth that he wanted to cut and he put the rip fence right over to the point where he knew, okay, th if I drop it down now, the distance from my sacrificial fence to the outside of my stack dado is the perfect width of my, my rabbit. So he started the saw up, held the, the saw, the sacrificial fence with his left hand out on the outside end of this thing and then dropped it down. Well, it grabbed through the, rip, the sacrificial fence back out of the way and dragged his, hand, his left hand into that stack dado. It removed three fingertips, two, three, two fingers and a thumb, really. Um, and I can tell you, when he came out of the machine room like this, dripping blood, I ran in to find the parts that he cut off. And when I saw he had a stack dado on there, um, there's really not much to pick up except a little bit of hamburger because that's what it does. So once again, you cannot overcome the power and the, uh, and the, the inertia of the saw. You cannot um, get your hands out of the way fast enough that you won't get hurt and you can't get your body out of the path of the material uh, quick enough that you won't get hurt. Um, when you know, weeks later, after he'd been going through uh, physical therapy and stuff, he stopped by the shop to, to check out what was going on. And I asked him why he did that. He said, you know, I've done that a thousand times and never had a problem. I said, no, you did it 999 times and you got lucky. The 1,000th time you didn't. So the proper way to do that, if you were going to put a sacrificial fence on, is to clamp it to the fence, lower your blade down, move the fence into position, turn the saw on, step out of the way, and crank the blade up into that sacrificial fence. You can then make your height adjustments and your width adjustments as you need to. Um, don't be silly, just, you know, don't try and beat the tool. It will win every single time. And these are not replaceable, okay? Um, you can replace a rip fence that gets damaged. You can, you know, replace a board that gets destroyed. But please make sure that you are out of the path of the wood and out of the path of the blade every time you use the saw. One of the things that I try and it, that I had a really hard time getting apprentices to do was engage their brain um, when it came to running the saw. You'll notice that when I told the story of Joe cutting those eighth inch by two inch by three foot long pieces, I was not in the room, the doors were closed, but I knew what happened, okay? Because I heard the saw slow down. I want you to engage all of your senses when you start using a table saw. I want you to listen. Make sure that you can hear the saw motor. That's what you should be focused on. If you hear the saw starting to slow down, that means something's binding. It's time to turn the saw off. Okay? <clears throat> smell. If you smell something burning as you're doing it, that means something's binding again against that blade, which means 
it's time to turn the saw off and figure out what's happening. Um, feel. If I feel weird vibrations or something happens. On my Powermatic 66, it came with just a splitter with a couple of any kickback paws on it and a basket guard that was just a complete disaster. Um, those things were so unsafe that I think in the original owner's manual it said remove this and throw it away. Um, I'm joking, but it's pretty close. Um, so for a long time, I never had anything on there. <clears throat> uh, we had a, a very near miss of an accident in the shop with one of the apprentices. So I bought an aftermarket um, riving knife by Beesmeyer and stuck it on there. And I had already gotten all of my apprentices used to listening, smelling. Um, if, you, if you hear it slow down, you sm start to smell wood burning. Something's binding, shut it off. Well, with the new riving knife on there, they, started, they would start to cut in and the material would bind against the riving knife, which would bring the material to a dead halt. So, in, but they didn't smell anything burning and they didn't hear the saw slowing down. So they would just push harder. And when you push harder, eventually it will let, let loose and it usually does it in an uncontrolled fashion. So please make sure you, if something weird happens and you feel something different, an odd vibration, um, a stop, don't just push harder, don't lift up, don't twist shut the machine off, try and figure out what's going on and, and make adjustments from there. So hear, smell, feel, taste, okay? When you start to um, cut and that wood is starting to bind, you're still breathing in and um, small particulate from this stuff. If you're cutting maple, you're, you're going to all of a sudden uh, start to taste a little bit of sweet smoke, okay? Again, something to watch for. If it becomes, if it's, you start to combine it with all of these other things, you see things drifting away from the fence, you hear things, you feel things binding up, you taste uh, that caramelization of the sugars in the different woods that you're doing, you're using. <clears throat> all of those things are warning signs, so you should not be as, uh, my old uh, master, Werner Dewar, used to say, you should not be thinking about the Muppet Show last night. You should be focused on what you're doing. And that's exactly what you should do. You should be engaging all five of your senses and your brain. And when two or more of those senses are, are starting to throw up those warning signs, shut the saw off, figure out what's going on. If you can't figure out what's going on, figure out another way of cutting that particular thing. I don't care whether it's a cross cut, a rip, any of those things, you can find either with a jigsaw, with a bandsaw, come back later for the bandsaw class and you'll see. Um, you can do all of those things in some other way. And you know how I know? Because the table saw wasn't introduced into the workshop until the late 1800s. And yet somehow we managed to cut all of these things for a thousand years before that. So that's what I'm saying. Take and really focus on that, on what your task is at hand. I have been operating a table saw for 40 plus years and I have all 10 and I have never, not once in my entire life, come in contact with a spinning blade. Okay? Because when I start to work on the saw, and the rip, the rip fence is primarily the, the area that's going to cause the most problems because you, your material can start to bow and pull away from the fence, bind on the back of the blade, get kicked out, drag your hands in. All of those different things really are going to happen here much more so than if we work on cross cutting. Okay, So that's why I focus this whole class on the safety aspect of keeping your body and your body parts out of the path of the blade and out of the path of the material being ejected. I want you to turn around and engage all five senses and your brain before you even start. Think about what's going to happen if everything goes wrong and this thing kicks out of there. 
Where are my hands going to be? Where's my body going to be? Am I shooting this thing back into something, you know, do I have a propane tank behind me that's going to get pierced by this thing? Um, remember, 20 feet into a, into a solid wood door, it buried that itself in there a quarter of an inch and then bounced back another 40 feet. I can't get out of the path of the blade and I can't get out of the path of the, the wood faster than it's going to come off of this machine. Okay? Keep all of that stuff in mind. Plant that left hand. Pass it on through. Push all the way past the outside. Engage your brain. Think about it before you start. Think about it through the process. And if something doesn't go quite right and you escape the injury, try and figure out what happened so that you don't make the same mistakes again. Cross-cutting is fairly simple. I want to hit that real quick before we wrap up here. Like I said, we're going to do some stuff in a few weeks on uh, cross-cut sleds. Once again, I'm going to make sure that I've got a straight edge against... I'm, I'm not running bowed, twisted, or crooked material up against my rip fence because that's not going to give me a st smooth, straight, accurate cut. I'm not going to do cross-cutting the same way. I want to make sure that the, the edge of the material that I put against my, my miter fence here is nice and straight, because that way I get the most stable material. I want to make sure that it's flat against the table. And when I cross-cut, I want to make sure that I cut all the way through. One of the things that I forgot to talk about earlier in this class is how high I set the saw blade when I make rips and cross cuts. For me, that rule really falls down to about between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. I usually do about the height of the carbide on the teeth. So if you've got about a quarter of an inch, somewhere there, maybe a little low, lower, the idea is if I don't have very much of the blade sticking up, if I happen to start thinking about that Muppet show like Werner warned us not to, um, and my hand is in the position, uh, I'm going to leave a little nick. I'm not going to have this thing sticking way out there and cut it off. Uh, the other thing you have to realize is you've got a 10 or a 12 inch or an, an 8 inch or whatever size saw you have. That's a big spinning eighth inch thick disc. Uh, it, it's not exactly rigid. Okay, you can get it to warp and twist and move. Um, so as you are running stuff, as you're ripping things, if it starts to bind and twist and he generates heat, it, you could see it wobble, which could cause some problems with binding and kickback. So once again, the object here is make sure your hands are out of the path of the wood or out of the path of the blade. So if I look at this and I say, as I cross cut this, what's the potential for kickback or some other problem? I don't really have too much of a problem on this side. I'm going to have more of a problem with that piece of off fall that comes off of that uh, waist side as I cut through there. So I want to make sure that I'm standing far off to the side so that that material if it gets kicked back, it doesn't come in contact with me. That's really all I care about. So once again, I'm making sure that I am out of the path of whatever material is coming off the blade. My hands are set so that one hand holds it down to the table. The other hand holds it tight against the miter gauge. And this way, when I push, I push all the way through. I clear the back of the blade. When I rip, I clear the back of the blade. I want to make sure that if I let go of the <clears throat> I want to make sure that if I let go of the board no matter where I am I'm not in contact with that spinning blade when I do because if I do that's when it's going to kick back. Okay? So hopefully uh you've gotten some good tips out of this if you uh I'm going to open it up now. Uh, hopefully I've been trying to take care of some of the questions as they've come up along here. Um, if you have more questions, I'm going to stick around for about another 15 minutes. 
uh, in, you can chat with me. Uh, if you don't get your question answered or you don't want to ask a question now during the session, um, certainly go to the website for the month of woodworking shows. Click on my, uh, you should be able to get my email address off of there. Send me, a, send me any questions you have. It doesn't have to be about the table saw um, or the, the later session on the band saw. You can ask me any woodworking question. If I don't know the answer, I'll lie because you don't know any. I mean, I'll find you the right answer. Um, either way, uh, I'm happy to help if I can. Please, um, if you have questions, let's get to them. And make sure you come back next week because we're going to start to cover dados, rabbits, and grooves and how you can create them on the table saw. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.